everyone. Back to Cat's Eye on the Future. Tonight we have a very special interview with author and room master Havel Dr. Gunderson, who in the interest of full disclosure also happens to be my husband. But I think after 19 years together, I think he really does have some really interesting things to say, not to mention he has a degree in Old Norse Studies from Cambridge University in the UK. So he's going to talk tonight about some of the runes, some of the history of the runes. We had Freya Oswin on recently, and she also gave her perspective. And they're just going to be probably a little bit different, some of it will be the same, but I just think it will be interesting to get it from two different, very different viewpoints. Uh, and first off, I'm going to ask you uh, to say hello to the audience. Hello, audience. Perhaps what we could talk about first is, would you like to go into some background on the runes? Maybe some history? Freya kind of told us it was an alphabet, but okay. that was pretty much what we got. Yeah, um, first a, a few words about myself and Freya Aswin. We're very, very, very close. We worked extremely closely when I was in Cambridge and she was in London. But we're kind of like the right and left halves of the same brain. Freya is extremely intuitive, extremely perceptive. So a lot more of my information comes from, from academic study, but quite often we find out that we were starting from different places and perspectives, but we usually end up in the same place at the end. Um, so that that's me and Freya. Um, Which is really, I think that that's very important. It, it's not that you guys exactly disagree on things, but you come at it from different directions. Yeah, I, yeah. We we very seldom, if if ever, find that we actually disagree on things. But there are things that she picks up that I don't, and vice versa. You know, we we sort of work as a confidence system. Now, she did explain that the runes were originally an alphabet. She was rather mystical in some of their origins. Yeah, so I'll give you more of, I guess, what we would call the exoteric, the historical perspective on the rune staves. Um, and the first thing I'm going to say is those spiky, lettery looking things, what you carve on wood or trace in the air and chant or whatever, they're not actually runes, they're rune staves, they're letters. The, the rune word actually properly means the, the phrase of power, the song, uh, the thing that you write down in rune staves. Now, this is kind of a hard concept to get across since we've been using the word runes for the letters in the academic community as well for um, teen years. Um, and Chris Fell pointed out some time ago that this was not correct, but old habits die hard. You'll probably hear me making a slip of the tongue once in a while. Okay, so what, what we know about the development of, of the ring staves, we know that they were designed to be carved on wood. And the reason we know this is because there are no cross lines. Line, the lines of, of the staves are either straight up or they're at, at a slant to avoid cross-cutting the grain. Now, the entire first hundred or, or so years of the runic corpus has been lost. Um, the things that the ones that survived best, they tended to be the ones in carved into stone, stamped or engraved into metal, or whatever. So our early earliest inscriptions are nearly all on stone or metal, but we know that they had to have the cursive in wood because that's what they were designed for. The second question that has vexed um, at least the academic community for a very long time is when, at what point, and to what degree were they seen as magical in and of themselves? And we don't really have any good answers to that. But it's there seems to have been some pretty definite magic used pretty early, perhaps by the second or third century. Around the fifth century, we have a couple of rune stones which mention the runes, um, either the staves, um, or more likely um, the phrasing, but possibly the staves in which they were written, given by the great gods. There, There is this sense that this power of vocalization, this power of vocal magic, is something that comes from the gods, and that's borne out in much greater specifics later, of course, with, with the surviving Norse tales of the gods. So anyway, we have... We have the, these staves, and we know that what, at least that what they were good for, what they were probably used for earliest, was writing down magical inscriptions, religious inscriptions, 
inscriptions of power, um, or at least that's what survived. Now, the problem is that the ones that were written on the things that survived best, it's an effort to carve something in stone. It's expensive to have something stacked or engraved into precious metal. So those tended to be the most significant things. Because we're missing that whole early corpus, we don't know if it's start, they started out as they were being used in and immediately after the Viking Age as primarily a, a simple mundane alphabet that could also be used for religious purposes. What we do know in terms of magical development is that one of the earliest forms of Norse magic, indeed perhaps of human magic, was the power of the voice, the power of the word, the, the song, the spell, the vocal enchantment. And when the Germanic people got the rune staves, this was, if you like, a major development in magical technology, because now instead of simply chanting or singing your runes, your phrases of power, you could actually engrave them onto a significant item or, or a, a simple piece of wood or whatever, and create something that would last. You could create a, a magical item with which you could do things. For instance, the Craggahole Spear Shaft has quite a long and complex inscription on it, and including a couple of vine runes, a pair of, of staves, um, which are incorporated into a single stave. And the inscription and what we know about the use of throwing spears in the later Norse, as a means of hallowing the enemy to the coast to Odin, suggests to us that this particular item was being used to cast over the enemy host to dedicate them to Odin and thereby win victory by default when Odin took the lot of them. And so that, that was a, a very significant advance in magical technology. Now, a bit later on, we find that the rune staves have individual names, and these names are very consistent through the Anglo-Saxon um, and the Old Norse. They're also consistent with those examples we do have where an individual stave is used in magic. For instance, there's a couple of rune stones in Denmark which have the in invocation of Thehu, of wealth, and of Yero, good harvest. And these, these are memorial stones, but they also seem to be stones um, invoking the power of the chieftain being memorialized to continue to bring wealth and good harvest to his lands. Was this because he was had the concern of a divine ancestor? Uh, yes. Um, we have later accounts in the sagas, several accounts of a lo local king or chieftain who was believed to continue to bring wealth and fruitfulness to his lands from the mound. And this overlaps a bit with the cult of the elves, but that, that's quite a, a complex thing. It's certainly an ancestral function. It's also an extension of, of the understanding of, of the Holy King as having some responsibility for the fruitfulness of the land. So the, the king in the mound, therefore, or the chieftain, um, as, as it may be, is one of the first guys you'd ask if, if he'd been a good chieftain and brought prosperity and you wanted that state of affairs to continue. Um, I think Harold the Black was a well, later Norwegian king. Actually, his subjects were so keen to get hold of his body that, that he was divided up into pieces for the, the different areas of his kingdom so that his, his mana, his, his attention, would be sort of evenly shared out. That's um, uh, interesting. I'm, I'm sure my audience appreciates hearing about that, I think. Uh, perhaps we should move on a bit to how did the runes become a myth of divination? Now, Freya suggested that people looked into the well of weird and somehow Im imagined or realized this was a system. Uh, could you get a little more specific on that? Yeah, um, I, I think from an esoteric point of view, that's a, as, as good a summation as anyone could possibly give. From an exoteric, from a historical point of view, it's a cloudy process of development. Tacitus, writing at the beginning of the Common Era, describes the Germanic tribes as doing divination by writing signs, notai, on twigs from a fruit or nut-bearing tree and casting them. 
Now, what we don't know is, were those the rune staves, very early rune staves? This is about the time we think they were being developed. Were they holy signs of the sorts that the northern peoples had already been using for a, a very long time indeed? We just don't know. What it does show us is this very, very strong Germanic sense of using something that appears to be governed by chance to track the streams flowing from the well of Weir as, as a form of divination. And again, Tacitus mentions that the Germanic people love to gamble, and uh, you know, a man might even gamble himself into slavery because that was his weird, that from more or less later terminology, but that, that was how the lots fell, that was his fate. We see div divination by lots continuing for various purposes all through the Viking period. The twigs which were used in the host, the Norse temple, for sprinkling around the blessing blood from the offering bowl were called lot twigs, um, again suggesting a possible use in, in divination, perhaps by how these, these batters fell, perhaps they could have had staves carved on them and been cast, um, perhaps they were drawn in a short stick way when you needed to draw lots. We don't really know. If one wanted an absolutely definitive practice, definitive origin for the modern practice of, you know, carving one stave per twig or tile or whatever, and either casting them out as a pattern or drawing three, I'd have to say that that's more or less a modern development. It's not something we can prove ever happened. You know, we have only these vague references. Allowing the possibility that more to the point supporting the, this fundamental method of casting for Weird to show herself through chance was very, very fundamental to the Germanic understanding of, of what Weird was and how you could come to understand it. Could you give a little more of an explanation to my general audience on what Weird is? Okay, Weird is, it's often translated as fate, but it's not really fate in the sense of in, in the Greek sense where you have the fates deciding things. Weird is probably best explained as causality. The Germanic people, and you'll see this in the Germanic languages to this day, you will note that we have no future tense. We have a past tense, we have a present tense, we have no future tense. You can't explain that something's going to happen in the future without using another verb. You know, this will happen, this shall happen. But you can, what you can only say with the verb tense itself is, this happens or this happened. Um, unlike Latin, which actually has a real future tense. I was going to say Spanish does as well. Yeah, the, the Romantic languages have real future tenses. The Germanic languages still don't. So there was this sense that, there, that everything that had happened in the past is still present at the same level, in a sense, in what we, we view as the well of weird. Then there is the now, that which is happening right now. And by knowing the weird, the past, and the shape of it, the currents, the layers that go on top of each other, each shaped by the ones below it, by tracing these, you can also trace the likeliest possible outcome. Sometimes there are things you can do, you know, acts of will or of magic, whatever, to work around this. You can't alter it any more than you can hit an undo button and change something that happened two days ago, but you can you can change it. And the best example of this survives in a, a German fairy story of Sleeping Beauty. As everyone will, will remember, here is this kid and here here come, you know, good good fairies um, and they say, okay, she's going to be beautiful, she's going to be a great dancer blah, 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 and they've all given their gifts, and then along comes the Wicked Fairy, and she can't change um, anything that's already been laid down in Weird. She can't say, no, she's going to be dog ugly, no, she's going to be a complete klutz. She can't do that because this is set. But what she can say is, yeah, 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 and she'll have all these things, and then she'll prick her finger on a spindle when she comes of age and die. And then the, the last one, the one that's held back and comes after her, again, she can't undo this. She can't say, no, she's not, this isn't going to happen. But what she can say, magically speaking, is, 
okay, it's written that it's set in weird, that she'll prick her finger on a spindle and die. But a long sleep is sleep is basically a little death. So it's go, it's going to be a form of death, but it's not actually going to be followed or go, you know, have to be buried. It's going to be this other form of death, and she then she'll sleep for a hundred years, and then the prince will come, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Which leads really great into you mentioned that the runes we don't know if they were used early on as a divinatory system, but my understanding is they were used a great deal in magic. Could you talk about yes. that a bit? Um, now, I mentioned earlier that each of them has a, a specific name and that these names are very consistent. Not only the names, but the order of the staves and their divisions. The oldest form of this system we know is the Elder Plutarch, which has 24 staves arranged in three families of eight. Now, around oh, roughly the 8th century in Scandinavia, this system, as the language changed from Primitive Norse to Old Norse, the alphabet system was cut down to 16. There were some staves, um, for instance, the T and the D stave were both represented by a T, so when you see a T in an Old Norse inscription, it could be a T or it could be a D, that kind of thing. Some sounds were simply flat out lost. For instance, we don't see the Perdro stave, the P stave in Old Norse, because there's no P in Old Norse. But even then, the division of three families remained the same. The, room, the staves were in the order they'd been, even though they were fewer, and they were still broken down into three families, with each of them staying in its original family, and still called eights, even though they were no longer families of eight. And there, there are several very sharp warnings in the, the Norse literature about confusing or spoiling the runes. So just a warning here, if you ever pick up a book where the standard Plutarch order has, has been changed, distorted, or otherwise messed with, do not set it aside lightly, but rather hurl it aside with great force. Wouldn't the exception be the final rune? Um, there's yeah, there's some question now that on the order there's some question in the Elder Plutarch inscriptions. It was not uncommon, as far as we can tell. We think this was for magical purposes to write out the full Plutarch though, and this practice continued through the Old Norse. But in a couple of the examples we have of the Elder Plutarch, there are two runes which seem to be switch places. There's some versions where the last two staves are Othala, the O stave, Inherited Land, and Dagaj Day. So you'll see some books that have Dagaj as the last rune and some that have Othala as the last rune. Both of these are acceptable, but they, they were, do or at least they were doing both of them, and if one was wrong, we'll never know which. And the Perdro, the P rune, and the Ihwaj, which stands for sort of an EI sound in the middle of the row. Again, we have at least one where the order of those is, is switched around. That, that's a fairly minor change. Yeah. Um, but if, if you see the book and, and the, the row doesn't, the alphabet doesn't start with Plutarch. And why do so many modern rune sets have a blank read? Um, because Ralph Blum is an idiot. I think you need to explain okay. that a bit um, to my audience. Yeah, these are letters. The blank rune was invented by a guy in, named Ralph Blum in the 1970s, also notable for having totally fouled up the Plutarch order, bunged interpretations from the E.G. onto the rune staves, and packaging them in a pretty little book with a pretty little pouch of, of ceramic runes. And he thought that having a mystical stave of weird that was blank would be such a good idea and would help him sell. And what was it supposed to be? The Proto-Germanic space bar? Maybe there's blank rune staves all over every rock in Scandinavia, for all we know. In inscriptions, they separate out words by dots or by sets of two or three dots. They don't separate them out by spacing. So there, there is no excuse for the blank rune. Not even a slight excuse for the blank rune. Once upon a time, Edward Thorson had the occasion to meet Mr. Blum and took him aside um, and said something to the effect of, why did you have to do this with, with part of our heritage, with a real system? 
why, why, uh, why did you do this to us? And Blum said, no, well, I could have used chicken bones just as well, but chicken bones wouldn't have sold. The wounds wouldn't heal when they sold. And could you just briefly explain who Edward Thorson is? Sorry, Ed Edward Thorson um, is a very noted author, primarily books on runic magic. He also holds a doctorate in the field. In fact, he wrote his um, doctorate on the subject of runes of magic. You know, a very, very interesting piece of work, bringing in anthropological theory as well as runology. He, he worked closely with some of the most noted people in the academic runological field while he was doing this. Um, I believe he was a protege of Klaus Hubel and such. You know, so he he is a, a very, very serious man who's, you know, there, there's se several people who have had a very significant impact on the development of modern runic practice. I don't know if one could fairly say that Ed Edred has been the most influential, but he's pretty well in the running. In fact, I don't think I would have ever really developed the interest in the rune staves if not for his book, because I, I picked it up and read it. And the, his book grew dark, um, and the first thing I thought was, wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. This is not, you know, just fuzzy, half-remembered, half making stuff up as one often sees in pagan circles, unfortunately. This is a guy who really knows what he's writing, and that got me truly interested, and I went on from there. You know, so really everything that I've done probably wouldn't have it if, if it weren't for Edward and the extremely high quality of his work. But isn't, hasn't there been uh, a bit more background than, I don't think they were just inventing the modern reading of runes in the 1970s, though. Doesn't it go back at least a little bit further than that? Or the um, I'm not entirely sure when, at what point the modern practice of doing casting divination comes from. I, the first people in the modern era to really take up runic magic again were a bunch of slightly peculiar people in, in Germany called the Armanen Group. Um, some people may have heard the name of Guido von Liszt. He was a, a big noise in the group, wrote a lot of books. And the Armanen people, um, Guido had some funny, funny theories. He was working on the premise that the rune song in Halkamal, which mentions 18 runes, almost certainly spells the tower, by the way, that this actually referred to the staves, and so he sort of scraped around and invented, appropriated a couple of extra to add on to the 16 stave younger Futhark. And the Armanen people, um, they invented this stuff they called rune in yoga, where you kind of twist your body into the shape of the rune while chanting the initial letter with, you know, various vowels behind it. And it's, you know, it, it's actually quite an effective meditative technique that you do look a bit of a trap doing it in public. Yeah, some of my first experience of the runes was walking around a rune class where they were attempting to recreate some of this and suddenly it looks like it's being kind of twisted into a pretzel while chanting strange sounds and it just it took me a few more years in getting to know you and getting to know things before I, I found really a way to apply that in, into my own life and spiritual practice. But this does lead us to a question I know is kind of hanging out there in the air, and that is when people think about runes, a lot of times they tend to think of like the Sawilo rune, which is the sun rune, doubled over and used by the SS, or perhaps the Afala rune even being used in, in Holland by the Nazis. Can you go into a little bit of, of the background with that and, and your opinions on it? Oh, why yes, there is a giant rhinoceros standing right there in the room. I'm glad you mentioned it. Okay, what was go going on there at the, the end of the 19th, um, beginning of the 20th century, there was a, a lot of various aspects to what you, you might call, some people would call the Pan-Germanic movement. And it ranged from, you know, some fair, fairly serious racism, um, which eventually, some of which he led to the Nazi party, to Guido and, and his friends running around holy places, standing in funny positions and chanting on, on special days. And Hitler himself was really extremely dismissive of these people. He, in Mein Kampf, he actually blasted the pan-germanic mystics because all of this pan-germanic mystic stuff 
was was diverting people from the real fight against the Jews, um, you know the, that that sort of thing. But the inclination um, to use the images, the symbols, and stuff that they perceived as fitting into the Germanic culture was, you know, obviously they they picked up the, the swastika. Um, they use rune staves as you know their various badges, various symbols. I I think the Lebensborn had the younger Hagalage rune. The Otala rune was, I believe, used in Holland for the the Dutch auxiliaries and the SS or or something to that effect. Um, I I don't remember the exact details, but I know that one of Freya's friends. And, and Freya and myself had some nasty experiences in Holland before he realized that the Othala belt buckle he wore was setting off some very, very bad memories for people. But this was, the, the important thing here was that this was a very, very superficial use. You know, it, they, they were not u using these staves for magical or, or religious purposes or even with very much attention to what they had had been used for or, or meant in the pre-conversion period. Himmler himself was a, a very dedicated monotheist and tried to restore this, quote, restore, um, this bizarre version of what he thought original Germanic religion had been for the SS, which was a monotheism, and he wrote and probably the, the only thing he ever wrote or said that's worth quoting, this rant to the effect of, you know, this these horrible people promoting this fable, this fairy tale, that our ancestors believed in gods and trees. Well, yes, I, I'd say gods and trees just about does sum up um, an awful lot of Germanic religion. You know, so so we're we're not talking about a lot of direct influence here. But we're not even talking about any sort of accessory attempts to restore Germanic religion or magic. And I believe a fair number of the Armanian people actually ended up in concentration camps. <laughs> You have been listening to part one of our interview with Cavill Duffer Gunderson here at Cat's Eye on the Future. If you would like more information on Cavill Duffer, just check the show notes for episode 10 on my site, MelodyPsychicReadings.com. Stay tuned. We will continue with part two of this amazing interview right after these short messages. All the music used on the show today is from MusicAlley.com, your source for free-to-air music for podcasts. The artist plays their music up for free-to-air in hopes that you, the listener, will visit their site and purchase some of their outstanding musical offerings. So after the show, why not visit MusicAlley.com and explore their extensive playlist? She goes home in the evening with the dew all on her have questions? The cards have answers. If you would like a personal reading with Melody, just go to my website, MelodyPsychicReadings.com, that's Melody with an I, PsychicReadings.com, for information, or email me at MelodyReader at gmail.com. Readings are available using Skype, phone, email, or even in person if you are lucky to live in Ireland. Why not find out what special messages the cards have just for you and book a private reading today? So basically, anybody can work with the runes. You don't have to be Germanic. No. You know, why, why would you? Well, it just, it's an association that some people yeah, have. Yeah, it's, so it's an association, and 
you know, a lot of people are drawn to the rune, rune staves um, and to Germanic religion in general because it is a part of their personal heritage. You know, they have ancestors from Scandinavia or Germany or whatever. But, you know, most of these people that could just as well have gone with the Celtic um, or the Native American or the Greek or the African or anything you please. You know, but there, there's certainly no, no requirement for any Germanic ancestry what, whatsoever to work with the rune staves or the Norse gods. Now, my, my feeling is if um, Odin wants someone's attention, you know, who am I to say that person is disqualified because they don't look white enough? Which um, brilliant, Presumably the gods know better than we do. Which brilliantly leads into something Freya said, but I was hoping you could explain a bit more. Because Frey, towards the end of my first interview with her, she was talking about how anyone who wanted to read the runes, even if they were not followers of Norse religion, should thank Odin and thank the Norns. But she didn't really explain why or how Odin was all that associated with uh, the runes. Now that that's one of the the crucial points. Um, yeah, the early earliest mention, as I said, is a, a general came from the gods. But Odin is, first off, he is the god primarily, consistently throughout the Germanic world, associated with this technique of Galdr, this verbal magic, which was the precursor of which the runes are a subset. Secondly, in a poem called Haubermal, the sayings of the High One, one section of it is Odin describing how he hung on a tree, wounded with his spear as, as an offering to himself. Um, it was since the earliest period recorded since the Roman Iron Age, the practice to offer people to Odin by hanging them spiritually. But so he sacrificed himself to himself, and one incorporated, internalized, found whatever the runes. Now again, the, this is, may very well be referring to Galder magic as a whole. You know, it's, it's commonly you see, in any artistic interpretation of this, and it's going to show the, the stave set da down at the bottom of the roots, I, I think it's more general than that. But yeah, you, you could take it that they're included as a subset of Galder magic. Interestingly, there's another poem, Sigurd Riefemal, which describes him getting staves and songs of power from, from Mimir's head, um, which actually... Possibly this is an ongoing process. A lot of Odin's search for wisdom is ongoing. You know, possibly there really were different ver versions of, of, of it because um, the Germanic people, they were a widespread oral culture. We're dealing with, you know, over 2,000 years in a number of different countries and languages without a central written dogma to say, and it's this way and must be seen this way. But they both basically convey the concept that this particular type of magic, verbal magic, more verbal plus writing, stems originally from Odin, that Odin was the one who found it and brought it to gods, humans, and other beings. So th this is why Frey is saying that, you know, even if you don't practice the religion as a whole, it's a good idea to say thank you to Odin for doing this, first for learning it, and then secondly for passing it on to everyone. And again, we're, well, as we see it, you know, the process of, of casting or drawing the runes is, is the process of tapping into the patterns of weird. And you, you can see weird as a personified being as the Vikings did to variable degrees, or just as a generic force as the Anglo-Saxons seem to have had. Although the Anglo-Saxon stuff is pretty much post-Christian, so who, who knows? Well, the three Norns um, are not recorded until quite late. There's Erder, um, Weird, Verdandi, roughly that which is becoming, Skuld, roughly that which shall be. They only, Verdandi only appears, her name only appears once in Voluspad. She's never mentioned anywhere else. Skuld also appears as a Valkyrie and is the name of Walter Kraki's not-so-charming sister. It seems pretty clear that the, the single possibly personification, Erdor or Weird, was, was the original, and, you know, the triad may have, may have been because the Norse loved, just loved triads, may have been influenced from the Greek Greco-Roman three fates. We don't know. Um, what we do know about 
weird or the norms is that they're only personified at best to an extremely limited degree. They're not beings that can be bartered with, convinced of anything, prayed to, placated. Even Odin, he goes to a lot of trouble to work around the weird that's already with him, but we never ever see him actually personally approaching Urther or the Norns collectively or anything like that. There's also some confusion in the, the term Norn. We think of the three Norns from the Holy Spow, but Norns is also used as a generic for any female being that is involved with the, the shaping of an individual fate, and in a couple of instances, just for seeresses. Snorri Sturluson, for instance, writing in Iceland about 220 years after the conversion, trying to collect everything he could find that had survived on the old religion, he describes the norms that come to a child's cradle at its birth or at its naming, and he says something about the effect of some are elves, some are humans, some are the daughters of Rollin, which is to say dwarves. Obviously, these are not to be confused with Urther sitting at her, or Weird sitting, sitting at her well, um, doing whatever she does with the Weird of the universe. You know, these are much smaller, much more active, much more lo local beings. You know, so Nor Norn is a, a pretty generic term. The one stories describes there the original from which the Sleeping Beauty terms most likely come. And if you were to recommend to somebody just starting out, if they wanted just to get an overview kind of Norse religion, is there any particularly easy access books that you would recommend? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, depending on, on their focus, I, I believe Diana Paxson has written an introduction to Alcifer. Mm -hmm. um, if they're more interested in, in the magic but also want to know about the religion, my own Teutonic Magic, which is available through Freya's web website as an ebook, you know, gives just a go over of the Norse religion and, and also, you know, a fair, fairly deep discussion of the concepts of the concept of weird, which is crucial to understanding what we're doing with the rune staves. Um, let's see, uh, uh, um, and of course, for a really fine, in, incredibly complete and in-depth uh, view of the religion and of, of its both its ancient and modern practice, um, there is our Croth, published by the Ring of Croth, available on Amazon, um, edited and partly written by me. And can you explain what the word Asatru means? Um, the word Asatru means basically trusting in the gods. And you refer to it as the name of our religion. Can you explain that a bit? Um, yeah, the the word Asatru is probably, again, a modern word. The earliest reference to it i found has been in Grieg's half-opera Olaf Tryggvason. Um, the first act, which is all that ever got written, ends with the chorus in heathen Norway singing A big Asatru, um, et eternal Asatru. The sagas just speak of it as the old custom. And sometimes, and occasionally, you get the word heathen as well, um, which, like the Latin based pagan, implies pe people living out in the boonies who haven't taken up the new fashionable religion yet. Alcetrus is a modern word. It really gained currency and became the primary term that most people use for the Germanic religion in the early 70s when. Spain, Bjorn Bankinson in Iceland, and, and Steve McFallon in, in the States, both independently started their groups. Steve's Al Alcetru Free Alliance, and I forget what Spain, Bjorn actually called his, but Alcetru was certainly the term the Icelanders took up. And they, that term has re remained the most common one, not least because, um, although there are people focusing on different places, times, subcultures because the vast bulk of the material we have is from the old Norse material preserved in Iceland. The tendency has always been to be very heavily Scandinavian oriented. E even in the academic world, when you're looking at Anglo-Saxon religion, you know, or traces of, of pre-conversion religion in Germany, mostly the framework that's being used 
properly or not, the evaluation is the Norse framework because it's what we have. Right. Well, and to kind of move back into the modern usage of runes, I had a question from one of my listeners, which was, what would you say if you're going to be, if you are going to be trying to do divination with runes, if you're learning them, what are some of the best materials to use? The best materials, well, um, a, a lot of people, and I think there's a lot to be said with this, go on the logic that whether Tacitus's signs were actually rune staves or if they were just, well, if, if they were actually rune staves or if they were pre runic holy signs, the idea of a tree that bears nut or, nuts or fruit was fairly important. And that the, the seem, seems to have been crucial to the early Germans for a casting form of divination. A lot of people will, will also prefer to use ash um, because of the common association of the world tree um, as an ash tree. Now, there, there are a, lo a lot of issues with that. There, there are a, a, a lot of other candidates, um, but that's the best known one. You know, and that, the ash is also associated with Odin because it was the characteristic spear wood. It's a very tough wood. It doesn't break easily, and it grows in very straight shafts. And so you you have that linkage with Odin. Some people will use the yew tree, which is the other very strong contender for the identity of the world tree, and is associated with death, with hanging, with the mechanism by which um, Odin got the runes. But I have seen staves made of all sorts of runes. My own set, I made myself from, self from the bones of a bear that I killed myself. You know, I have seen, seen people make them out of ceramic. I've seen people gra grave them on pebbles. It really does come down, I, th I think in the end it comes down to individual choice. It comes down with, to what the individual feels is most powerful and most suited to them personally. But if, if you're just starting out and have no clue, I'd say go with a nut or fruit bearing tree. Okay. And um, is it important to make the runes yourself if you can? It's much better to make the rune staves yourself if you can. The more you put into it, the closer your link will be. My book, Teutonic Magic, started out actually as a, a class. And the way I ran it was we'd read through the description of the, the stave, of its place in the culture, of its use, possible uses and meanings and such. Then I would read a, a sort of guided meditation based on the imagery associated with the place of the name in the culture. And then with that fresh in people's minds, they would then car carve and color the stave while chanting its name until by the time the whole class was over, not only did they know the staves pretty thoroughly, but they had a nice set of divinatory rune staves for themselves. On the other hand, you know, you could you could just as well. It, there's certainly nothing wrong with buying a, a set of commercially made, made staves and coloring them yourself, because the, the key thing, the thing that turns an inscription written in rune staves from a mundane note um, to a work of magic was actually the coloring and possibly the chanting, but particularly the coloring. Um, that's one of the earliest and things that comes up, and it's one of the most consistent whenever we get a description of how the runes were written, made, and activated. Is there any particular color? That... Um, always red. Now, the historical accounts of people using rune staves in magic in the sagas, it's always done with red. Some people in the modern world are, are real loonies about it. And the se second choice, in my opinion, would be red ochre. We know that that was being used in the, in the Stone Age uh, as a very significant means of hallowing the dead, probably to it, its visual likeness to blood, and of course, it's red because of the high iron content, so you, you also have that, that association, that linkage there. It's certainly something that go, goes back to earlier days and, and is extremely powerful. Edward also recommends red matter, at, which is a sort of poetic pun. The, the herd name matter with the old Norse word mother person, which is also the name of one of the 
wing staves, the M stain, stave, there's no actual etymological relationship, but there's a poetic relationship. Um, it works pretty well, but you know, if you're in a tight spot and don't want to use your blood, stop eating away at this using regular wing paint. Like most forms of, of magic, particularly magic from kind of oral non-dogmatic cultures, um, the rune staves allow for an awful lot of, I guess, per personal modification in how you do them. One of the most interesting questions that I've ever gotten in my entire career doing this was a guy that came up to me, and he had had this idea of actually making the staves out of red neon tubes and charging them by lighting them up, running electricity to them. And he's like, could I do this? Would this be horrible? Would the gods get me? Would it blow up? Whatever. And I thought about it for a second, and I realized that's a freaking brilliant way to empower the staves. I mean, you're literally running Thor's power right through those things to empower them. You know, it doesn't get much better. So so there wouldn't be, some in some magical systems, I know there's a tendency to try to avoid modern sources of power or computing or something. Not and, in the least, not even slightly. So the, basically this, you would, you would see that runic, or you would say that runic divination is highly compatible with the modern world. It, it is highly compatible with the modern world. One, one of the, one of the interesting things about working with the rune staves, and you know, this is probably true for any system, any good system. It's, it's certainly true for the Kabbalah. But you can choose anything um, and meditate on it a bit and find the, the stave to which it relates more closely. Um, you know, here is the internet. Um, Ansuj, the rune of Odin, the rune of um, associated, therefore, with, with verbal communication, with movement, with, with fluid communication. There you go. The rune of the internet. There you have it directly from Kabeldoffer Gunderson himself. Mine, sometimes I think the god of the internet is actually Loki. Maybe they are double teaming it. I was thinking that Parathro, which is the dice cup, and I, I personally happen to associate a lot with Loki. When that comes up and my computer's having problems, I often think the same thing. I think that Odin sort of handles communication. Loki probably handles things like viruses. Yeah, there, there, there's different opinions on some of the interpretations, um, e even among the best of us, and that's an example. When I see Pear throw the dice cup, I think of the power of Weird, of Weird herself, completely implacable and completely not giving a rats for any, any of the beings in the world. This is just causality and how it works. And when I see, I see that stave come up in a divination, I say, okay, this is something that can't be changed. You're stuck with it. The best you can do is figure out what's going on and get around. Whereas sometimes I see it that way, and sometimes I see it more as, oops, I think you better be ready for anything, because it might be kind of a bumpy ride, and you don't really know how the dice are going to turn. And I think that's, that's the interesting thing about the runes, is that unlike in the modern systems like the side cards, and Freya and I talked a little bit about this too, they're a really old system. There's only 20, 24 of them in, in most yeah. of the systems for reading. Yeah, there, it's it's a lot easier to work with the 24 Elder Greek Arc than the 16 Greek Elder Greek Arc. Because that would give you even fewer. Yeah, but it's of the... um, one, one of the things about runic divination that I found hardest when I started was I, I had come out of, you know, studying at the time Tayro and Kabbalah fairly seriously. And of course, in the Tayro, you have the major arcana and the minor arcana. And so they tell you right there, okay, this is a big, significant, major power influence, and this is just, you know, mundane stuff that's happening. There, there's a real distinction. With the rune staves, you don't have that, so you, you have to evolve other methods of figuring it out. The way I do it is I cast the whole lot down on, on the cloth or whatever, and assume that the... What, what is relevant is face up, and the positions relative to each other, the general patterns in which they fall, that's what tells me what is most immediate, what is strongest, what, what's maybe a side issue. It's also, and this is another thing about the rune staves that can make dividing with them difficult when you start out, there's not 
really, you know, you don't you don't really have bad staves and good staves, though there are some staves that are more much more likely to indicate disruption. But it, it's a question of context. You know, if if you ask a if you ask a question, the state the, the relationship of the state to the question is more likely to tell you whether it's it's going to be a, a beneficial or a baneful outcome. Sometimes staves all also work together to influence each other. For instance, if you see Thurisage, the Thurs, the giant next to Isa, which is ice, and Hagalaj, the hailstone, if you see these in a complex you know that you're probably not going to like what's about to happen next. Um, you, you really do. On the other hand, if you see um, Thurisage together with Wulio, that can indicate something ne necessary keeping you from getting too complacent. Um, it, it, the alternate name for Thurisage is Thorn, and that can be the Thorn breaking your sleep. Wulio is joy, and you'd think it was a a totally nice, sweet, wonderful stave, but to, it also, to me, describes the death of Balder in Snorri's version of it, the story where everything in the universe except the little leaf mistletoe has promised not to harm Balder, and the gods say, oh, cool, let's have this game where we throw weapons at Balder, because everything's fine, it's totally taken care of, it's fine, there's nothing to worry about, total joy, and... That's what we call complacency, and that's how he gets killed. Because, well, the mistletoe was worth worrying about after all. And so, you know, Wunyo can mean good stuff, or it can mean you've gotten into a complacent rut, you're missing something very, very important. Now, some people will use reversal of staves to make the, these judgments. I myself don't, because first off, of, of number of the staves can't be reversed. They look the same way either way they come up. Secondly, our ancestors, you know, weren't, weren't really locked into the whole left-right or, or any direction of writing. You get left to right, you get right to left, you get going back and forth like plowing the field. It, it, it just do, doesn't work at all for me. Now, one, one sometimes, um, because I do the full cast, sometimes you'll get a stave face up on top of another stave, or even worse, a stave face down on top of the stave that's faced up. And that to me usually means some sort of blockage, some sort of interference, some sort of shadowing of the one that's on the bottom. But most of the time, it's the context of the stave versus the question plus intuition. Um, this is one, one of the reasons why Freya, as one, is one of the top rune readers of the world today, because Freya is a seeress. The, the staves for her, um, they focus her intuition. She asks for the inspiration of the gods when she's working on them, and they, she she gets she gets the the information codified from her in the staves in front of her. But what what you're really getting with Freya is her intuition or vision. It's very very similar to the way Melody works with the, the rune staves and the cards. You know, it, it, any any fool can get themselves a pack of cards or a pack of runes and go to the book and see what the book says this means. But to actually make it really work for divination, you've got to have that that extra psychic stuff going on. Now, it's it's something you can develop. It didn't come all that naturally to me. I worked it out the, the other way around, going from understanding their cultural position and so forth, and a, a lot of practice because, you know, like, like, in, like mo most human capabilities, whether you start out with a huge great whacking lot um, or just a teeny bit, if you work on it, if you work with it and develop it, you're going to get a lot better at it. And somebody with almost no intrinsic to start talent to start out with, you know, they, they may never meet, reach a Freya Aswin level. Um, you know, they, they may be like a very small and delicate person who's never going to end up in the strongest man in the world competition. But if they work at it, they can still get to bench pressing 200 pounds, which is pretty impressive and quite suffice 
suffices for nearly all purposes. Well, that was really, really, really fascinating. Before we go, I, I was wondering if there's anything, a, a rune poem or any saying or anything you'd like to leave our, our listeners with, advice, tips from the sagas, anything? We're okay. Words of advice. As given to us by Odin, Aelix Dr. Greenson, great Viking rune master, and um, a couple of other people, I believe. Don't confuse the order and don't mess with using them for active magic until you really know what you're doing. You can't get into a lot of trouble directly with divination. You can get in a lot of trouble acting on divination if you're not very, very confident in it indeed. Um, but you're you're not going to actually magically mess yourself up by doing it. Unlike doing active magic with things, because it's kind of like rewiring your own house's electricity. You want to know what you're doing, and good intentions will not keep you from trying yourself. You know, we have plenty of warnings in the Viking Age about this. Um, in fact, a, a, at one point had to go rescue this poor girl who was dreadfully ill because a kid boy from the next farm over had tried to cast a love spell on her with rune staves, and they had to find the time scrape it off, burn it, carve his own staves to get her back to health, and came out with a fairly snippy poem about don't screw with it unless you know what you're doing. Well, I, I think that that's a really great thought to end on. So I, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. Perhaps you can come back again some other time and we can talk more about magic or the North gods or something interesting. So we'll look forward to that. And for now... We'll say good night. Good night, everyone. Well, here's a health to the company and one to my last. You have been listening to Cat's Eye on the Future, the show where we take a glimpse of the energies coming soon into your world and into your future. Be sure to join us again next time when we explore another chapter of Cat's Eye on the Future. Well, here's a health to the company and one to my last. Let's